Uh, welcome to the fourth talk in the Introduction to Common Compiler Tools series from LLVM Social Bangalore. And uh, I'm Ashutosh and I'll be presenting today's topic, uh, Compiler Explorer. So this is a tool that is very powerful and it's used by a lot of compiler developers all over the world. Uh, in fact, the tool has millions of uh, compiles like every week. So uh, as I go through this slide, you'll see a lot of new things as it's the first real deep dive where that we're doing in this series. You'll see a lot of assembly. You'll see uh, some LLVM IR. You'll see a lot of uh, compiler options that you are not so familiar with. And uh, that is OK. As long as you can understand why these things are useful and what the utility of using this might be, uh, that is sufficient, even if you don't know the background behind all the assembly instructions and stuff. So that being said, uh, let's get started. Right. So since we the first three talks that we had were uh, shared talks, we hadn't really done any intros. So since this is my uh, my individual talk and uh, since there'll be more individual talks later in this series. Uh, so here's an about me slide. I'm a compiler engineer at AMD. Uh, I work on the OCC compiler since 2021. Uh, previously, I've done Google Summer of Code with Arduino in 2020. I've worked with the Linux Foundation as a mentee for Intel Mobile Eye and uh, before that, I was an electronics enthusiast. I, I won a lot of hackathons and built a lot of uh, prototypes and drones and uh, prosthetics and stuff. Uh, I've been involved in co-organizing LLVM Social Bangalore since uh, June 2022, and uh, uh, you can always meet up on LinkedIn if you'd uh, like to connect. So now let's get started with the topic. So. What is the basic, very basic idea behind comp Compiler Explorer? So in the early 2010s or uh, say around 2008, 2010, 2011, uh, there was a software, there is a software engineer named Matt Godbolt. So the tool is named after him. Uh, he named it Compiler Explorer, but the community affectionately calls it Godbolt. So uh, he had an, uh, he had an issue. Uh, new versions of C++ was coming out, especially C++ 11 and C++ 14. And uh, the, these languages had these new features like range force and lambdas. So C++, every new revision gets a few new features. So he wanted to know what the effect of these uh, changes would be on his code. Like, you know, if I instead of using a for loop, if I use a range for what will actually happen? So uh, he came up with an idea. So he used this simple one line uh, shell script, which is the watch command. So the watch command can, uh, you know, like execute a specific command like every two seconds or so. So like if you give watch and uh, you give a command after that, it will execute it every couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. And then he invoked the G++ compiler with the flag for the uh, newest uh, uh, like C++ version. Yeah, he used a couple of compiler switches. He set the uh, like uh, syntax type, uh, type to Intel. You have at and syntax and Intel syntax for assembly. It's like the same assembly. It's just a different representation. And he used C++ field to demangle uh, the name mangling that the compiler does. So uh, since C++ compilers uh, support overloading and stuff, sometimes they add stuff to function names is uh, name mangling and uh, that can make stuff kind of hard to read. So he used C++ field to uh, remove the mangling and he used the grep line to sort of uh, remove some of the extra bits. And uh, then he used Tmux to split a screen down the middle and basically what resulted was this. Uh, so on the right side, he types his code and on the left side, it shows up as assembly. So this was the basic idea that you said, type your code on one side, and it shows up as assembly on the other side instantaneously. So uh, from there, where are we today? So uh, today, Godbolt allows users to edit code in C, C++, Fortran, Go, Python, and 36 other languages, and then see how this code actually looks after being compiled in real time. It allows you to step through code. It allows you to analyze code. It allows you to run tools on code and libraries. 
तो जी सी सी क्लैंग आई सी सी आई सी एक्स एम एस वी सी मिंजी डब्ल्यू ए सी सी ऑल ऑफ दीज वेरियस कंपाइलर्स आर सपोर्टेड फॉर मल्टीपल वर्जन सो नॉट ओनली द लेटेस्ट वर्जन ऑफ योर जी सी सी कंपाइलर सपोर्टेड ऑल वर्जन ऑफ जी सी सी आर सपोर्टेड राइट फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू सी हाउ कंपाइल रियली इवॉल्व थ्रू टाइम यू कैन डू दैट द वेब वर्जन इज होस्टेड ऑन गॉड बोर्ड डॉट ऑर्ग you can self host also if you want to and we learn how to do that also uh, godbolt is an open source project licensed under the bsd license so uh, the source code for the godbolt site and the godbolt tool itself is open source uh, even though all of the compilers that it might run might not be open source but the tool itself is open source Uh, it allows you to compare output of multiple compilers diffs filtered output tools such as llvm mc and much more and now it has over 30 lakh compiles per week so with that intro uh, what are the features it has so let's take a look at some of the features so one is that it has a golden layout that means you can have any number of windows you can have three panes four panes six panes pane split visible vertically or horizontally however you want it and uh, it uses the monaco editor so if you have used vs code uh, godbolt will seem sort of familiar to you it's the same kind of layout and it's the same editor now it can also execute binaries and there are a lot of tools integrated into godbolt uh, we'll be seeing only some of them and it allows you to share links so this is one feature that will make a, a use of a lot uh, this ppt itself has a lot of links and uh, after the talk will when i will be sharing the slides with you all you can click on those links and uh, work on the same examples and uh, that is sort of what makes it so excited for this talk because uh, you don't really need a powerful computer or even have any computer to try out all these examples even if you have a tablet or even a mobile phone uh, you can go try out all these uh, examples that i show you today so uh, you can share these links with others they persist forever and if you want to follow the latest updates on what features are being added to godbolt uh, personally the easiest way i find is to just follow them on twitter so you can do that so let's start with the tool so this is the basic layout and uh, we'll be taking a look we'll be switching between the browser and uh, the ppt frequently from now so like uh, let's just go to the browser version Right. So yeah, here you have your Godbolt website. I hope the text is visible. Maybe let me zoom it in a little bit. Yeah, that should be good. So uh, here you on your left you have your C plus plus source, and on the right you have your uh, the assembly output of that source code, and down you have the executable. So here you have your uh, you have a simple hello world program the most basic program so here you have the assembly that the hello world program generates and here is of course the output that the hello world generated program generates which is just uh, hello and world so uh, here you can see that uh, this uses the monaco editor so it looks somewhat like vs code and these windows are all resizable so you can if you just want to see the assembly and don't care about this uh, executed output you can just close that here and you left it left with only the assembly and this thing if you want to say uh, just add a new compiler here or if you want to add another window you can just do a plus and you can add another compiler here so here you are executing the same code in gcc 9.1 and now you are executing it in gcc 13.2 although since you are uh, like only executing a hello world program there is no real functional difference between both but yeah you will come to see examples where this is useful so you can have any number of windows resizable windows and uh, having a large monitor definitely helps to use godbolt because it can get pretty crowded so in the example that i have uh, here we have a fortran program on the left side for an assume align pragma so what it does is not important but here i can see that even if i give the flags for uh, uh, the intel's uh, Uh, reporter tool intel's vectorization tool uh, it gives reports so uh, it can give you a vectorization report on how well your program is optimized and all that so you can even get the output of the report itself so uh, it's uh, it you can basically execute uh, simple examples right from inside the layout so now that we have the basic layout down 
Uh, the first thing is the execution support. So you already saw this in the previous slide. So here is an example of a Godbolt link. So these short links and long links, the long links allow you to basically embed Godbolt into any web page you like. And the short links basically store it in their servers. So here you can see that we have a Hello World program and uh, with GCC 9.1 and here you are the output. So now let's start with the features. One feature is that it allows you to compare the assembly of different languages and of the same language. So for example, this example that I have right here is uh, a, a C++ and Rust compiler. So I have Rust 1.33 and I have GCC 11.2. We have the simple. Uh, we have a simple function that just returns the square of a number. Nothing very complicated. And here you have the assembly generated by Rust, and here you have the assembly generated by GCC. And you can see you can take a diff of them basically. You can see how the like uh, output differs, and like here you have a move and uh, IML instruction, and then a return instruction. Whereas uh, here you have a IML instruction, and then you have a move instruction. So uh, it's very powerful that way for comparing assembly. Like if one compiler does things slightly uh, differently from the other, you might want to uh, like just check what the difference is. Or even if you have different languages, uh, how does their assembly really look? What what does Rust do that C C++ doesn't or vice versa? Uh, so again, I want to emphasize that the code examples in this presentation are very, very simple and basic because uh, this is not a presentation on compiler optimizations or compiler flags or features. It's about the tool itself. So uh, here's another example. You can see the output with different compiler flags. So uh, the example I've given here is one with coverage. So uh, code coverage is one of the talks that we'll have later in the series. But uh, the basic idea of code coverage is uh, if you want to know how many times a for loop or an if statement was taken, how many times a branch was taken, how many times certain statements were executed, uh, you can get to get to know it through code coverage. Now, how does code coverage work? Basically, it has to instrument your code. Uh, does anyone here know what instrumentation is? Okay. Yeah, Siddharth, please uh, go ahead and tell us. Yeah. Uh, so instrumentation is uh, modifying the assembly code uh, to achieve certain kind of uh, tasks. So for example, uh, instrumentation can replace debugging in some ways. For example, uh, at some place if you want to know value of uh, register or modify it, then you can use instrumentation yeah. to statically or dynamically change the value. So yeah, that's a nice functional definition. Basically, to do to do instrumentation, you have to add something to the code. So like, let's say if I want to count how many times a for loop was taken or how many times a function was executed, I have to add some kind of a counter, right? Uh, like let's say uh, a racks register or uh, some kind of register. So here I can see I have the same code here, C++, and I have the same version of GCC. So I just have a two line function, again a square function that returns the square of the number. So here I can see that here I've executed it with F profile arcs F test coverage, and here I've executed it uh, without any compiler options. So here you can see just because I added that compiler flag, I have all of these extra counters. So you can see every time uh, this path is taken, the racks counter is added by one, and there is an entire data structure that is created by the GCO code coverage tool just to, you know, really instrument this. So I can just like change the flags here. Like let's say I change this to hyphen O2 O2 or something. And so now this is at O2 and this is at O0 and this is showing me the assembly between O2 and O0. So uh, the, basically you can see the difference, uh, like effects of different compiler flags on your code. So again, uh, Let's uh, continue on with our journey. So one very useful thing to me is that uh, I don't know a whole lot of x86 assembly. Uh, that's sort of the thing that's left to experts because the x86 assembly goes really deep. When you learn the basics, you discover that there are all these vector instructions and you have your XMM, ZMM, YMM registers, and 
you have a whole lot of things because x86 is a complex instruction set ar architecture where there's a lot of assembly instruction it's uh, very different from MIPS or ARM. So sometimes I don't know. So like here, like let's say we have a basic program to count set bits. So basically it just counts the number of set bits in a binary representation of a number. How many bits are one? So one advantage is that you can see is that this highlighting, right? So like I want to see what uh, this while loop is there. So how much of this while loop actually corresponds to this program? So this, if I just like hover over the while loop, I can see that all of this text turns blue. So this test, J, BLSR, J, N, E, RET instruction, all of these turn blue. Now this count plus plus is represented by this increment operation. So increment is VX. So whether you click on, go on the assembly side or on the code side, you can see the corresponding code here and you can see the corresponding assembly. Now, let's say you don't know what this BLSR instruction is or what JNE instruction is. You can just hover over it and it will show you that the BLSR copies all the bits from the source operand to the destination operand and resets the bit position in the destination operand. So like, let's say that this much explanation is not enough for you. So you can really left uh, right click and click on view assembly documentation. So this will bring up even more extensive documentation. And even then, if you're not satisfied with that much documentation, you want even more documentation, you can visit the BLSR documentation page and it takes you to Felix Cloutier, Cloutier's website, which has a whole lot of documentation on each and every single assembly instruction. So every time I like uh, run a program and I come across some weird assembly instruction that I haven't heard of, or uh, I don't exactly know what the assembly stands for. So then this comes very handy because it can show you what the meaning of each assembly instruction is. And really, as you modify your program one by one, you can see the assembly changing and uh, get to know. So then let's come back to our uh, presentation. So as I said, you have links for even more documentation. And yes, you have graph output. So this graph output is really useful stuff. If you want to see the control flow of a program, you can really just add new and you can click here as control flow graph and it will generate a nice control flow graph for you that shows how the program flows and you can see that this particular while loop here is executed again and again so it loops back on itself and this this is the final state so if you want to visualize how control really flows from programs one to one to another you have this uh, very useful uh, uh, graph output view so uh, now we have a couple of LLVM specific things also that it does. One is the LLVM OPT pipeline viewer, and this is a very new feature. This was added only a few months back. So LLVM opt as uh, Prerona and Pradeep have covered in previous sessions. Uh, the LLVM optimizer has a lot of optimization passes that execute one after the other. So here we have a very simple factorial function that returns the factorial of a number. And uh, we have the assembly of it at O3 optimization level, the highest optimization level with Clang 14. And here you can see the entire LLVM pass pipeline. You can see the SROA pass, the global op pass, inst combined pass, simplify CFG pass, which all passes have taken effect, what effect they've had, how they work. So uh, this has an LLVM opt uh, pipeline viewer, and this is also easily accessible. So here, Basically, in your plus button you have, you can see the LLVM IR. So if you want to see the IR, you just add that here and uh, you can uh, uh, basically get the IR. I think it's a bit slow. Okay, never mind. So uh, yeah, LLVM IR or in case of GCC, you can see the RTL or Jimple output. Uh, you can see the preprocessor output. You can see the control flow graph that I just showed you. So all of these are easily available at the click of a button. So then, uh, yes, it has support for a lot of tools such as Clank ID, Clank format and all, but uh, one of the tools we'll take a look at a little bit in depth is LLVM MCA. So I don't know a whole lot about LLVM MCA myself because it's a, a very deep tool. Uh, the MCA tool is basically the machine code analyzer. So this example, let's go over it. It's a sum over array example. 
So you have some over array function here and basically just executing LVM MCA with O2 and supplying which architecture you want. So here I've supplied uh, MRC is equal to Hashwell, I believe. Yeah. So here you can see how many iterations, how many instructions, the total cycle, the latency, throughput, and a lot of other very low level data on how the uh, program is executing on this particular uh, CPU and what the execution looks like. So LLVM MCA again has a lot of uh, modes. They also support a analysis pseudo language, which is basically a sort of, uh, you can feed it assembly as the input and it will show you the uh, LLVM MCA output for that. So yeah, here instead of, uh, like here you can see that we had a, uh, uh, this thing. So here we, we have our XMM registers as our input and in the output you have again your total cycles, total micro operations, your IPC, block throughput and all that. Now uh, if you want to go even deeper, you have your timeline view. So with uh, the timeline flag and MCPU, like you can specify a CPU architecture here and just specify it's Skylake, which is one of Intel's processors. You can see the decode, decode uh, weight instructions and how they execute on the CPU. So execution, the average time spent, average time waiting for each instruction. So if you really want, you can drill down all the way to how code executes on the CPU. So uh, that's just a bit into the power that uh, this tool and uh, LLVM MCA together offer. So another is conformance view. So conformance view is really uh, important because different compilers, right, uh, they support features differently. Sometimes uh, some compilers follow the, say, Fortran or C++ standards very strictly, while uh, some of the others don't follow it that strictly. Uh, there's, uh, they might have some allowances. So some programs that execute in one compiler <laughs> might not execute in another compiler. So here you have a standard C program and you are feeding it to various compilers. Uh, like you have a just a program that turns up uh, like uh, two of a character, that's it. We have Clang, GCC, ICC, ARM Clang, and Zig, the Zig compiler, and uh, yeah, TCC. So you can add this, say, compiler flags to all of these and see which one of them will execute. So Zig language has its own syntax, and the F profile has F test coverage flag is not supported there, so you can see that that is crossed out, that it doesn't really work there. So, like, if you like, you know, if you ever want to decide that, you know, which compiler should I use for this particular purpose? Is this feature supported there or not? So for that kind of use case, it's uh, sort of useful. So performance view is really useful. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Now it also allows you to hash include URLs from GitHub. And it also allows you to support CMake. So, Hash include URLs from GitHub as in uh, like, let's say you want to include your own code in GitHub uh, from GitHub. So here's like some GitHub code written in a GitHub just somewhere. So as long as you have that raw uh, URL that uh, is like without any formatting. So like, let's see what this uh, particular snippet of code is. Uh, it's taken from GitHub, so okay. Uh, so this is a piece of code that uh, this person wants to include in this example. So we can just do a hash include and point it to the GitHub URL and that can be included. So this is very helpful if you have some, you know, some of your own written libraries or templates or stuff that you want to include into Compiler Explorer, but uh, want to just stick to using the online version instead of posting your own. And uh, finally, there's now CMake support. So I don't really recommend compiling very uh, complex uh, programs or applications inside Compiler Explorer. Uh, the online version has very limited resources, but uh, if you want to do that, now it supports an IDE mode. So here you can see that the code is an IDE mode. So here you have just like an IDE, right? You can click through your files and see the code for various uh, uh, files. And you can, you can have a CMake script that actually here is our CMake list.txt that will uh, uh, build all these into an executable. So now it even supports CMake. So uh, if you have some very simple uh, executables that you can link together using CMake and want to check, test them out on Word uh, in an IDE style fashion, you can do that too. 
Yeah. So this is yeah, just ID mode. So it has a lot of additional features. There are support for tools like client ID, client query, client format. Format. Uh, it has uh, tools uh, support for some uh, uh, cyber security related tools also like Osaka. The support for PA hole, read L. Uh, uh, it also supports x86 to 6502. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned before, you can see the GCC RTL uh, entry. You can see the Clang IR and parse tree. I believe I demoed this uh, before also, but uh, like if you have any program, like uh, like let's take the program here. Yeah. So the sum over bits. Let's uh, just come here. Let's choose Clang. Which clang should we choose? X86 clang. Uh, okay, let's choose some release clang here. Yeah. Okay, this should be fine. So here, like, uh, if you really want to see the uh, uh, IR, you always have the option to give S emit LLVM. Uh, S emit LLVM will just give you the LLVM IR. So now you can see that the assembly that we were seeing before has been replaced by LLVM IR. And uh, you can see that if you want to say, see the preprocessor uh, pre output, or you want to see, uh, uh, let's say the AST output. So let's say X clang AST down. So it all depends on the compiler switches, right? So whatever uh, compiler switches are supported, let's see. Maybe I type that wrong. Maybe it's down AST or maybe I got uh see okay maybe this is x capital clang and yeah this should work okay never mind i got the wrong flag so you can just dump the ast you can dump the source you can uh, dump tokens just using your standard compiler switches uh, it also supports several libraries uh, such as uh, AppSeal, Google Benchmark, Blaze, Boost. So if you have Boost C++ uh, dependencies and all that, you can just select it. There's a list of libraries uh, in the drop down menu over there. You can just select it off there. On uh, locally wo hosted versions of Godbolt, you can add any library you want. So like if you have a directory, you can just add the library over there. Uh, it also supports QuickBench and Google Benchmark. So like uh, as just as a fun aside, there is a tool that uh, goes the other way, which appears, which tries to do the opposite, which is taking a compiled binary and trying to generate source code. And it's known as Decompiler Explorer. And of course, it, it's called Dog Bolt instead of, right? I mean, uh, this Dog Bolt taken in reverse, right? So uh, obviously, uh, like uh, reconstructing source code from assembly is very different from uh, uh, like source code from a binary is very different from going the other way around. Uh, like uh, because uh, it's a not an exact science. Like your compiler might have done some optimization. It might have unrolled loops. It might have rearranged the code. It might have done some optimizations like eliminating dead code or doing strength reduction or some other optimization. So, but anyway, it's an interesting tool, especially for uh, people who take part in cybersecurity contests like CTFs and all, where uh, sometimes you have to decompile binaries to find in interesting stuff. So, it only supports uh, executables up to 2 MB, but uh, it is there. So, uh, just an aside. So, how is this tool actually built up? Okay, uh, so before that, I think this is the second half of the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions or uh, any comments? Hi, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, I just noticed that uh, Compiler Explorer has support for RISC-5. Is that true? Which one? Yeah, RISC-5, yes, it does. So oh, not awesome. only RISC-5, it supports ARM, RISC-5, uh, MIPS, and a lot of other architectures. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, they have made that available through some are through cross compiling and some have uh, native hardware. Uh, it is right, there. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, just that. I just wanted to cross check. I saw yeah. right. Yeah, no, you saw right. It is definitely there. So, That's okay. Oh, sure, sure. 
Uh, hi, Ashutosh, one question here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, so, hi. So, if I locally host the compiler explorer, I can include my own compiler yes. and maybe my own IRs in between. Right? Yes, that is a very good question because the next 15 minutes is on how to do that. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. Sure. Yes. Thanks. All right. So, uh, let's continue uh, with the internals of compiler explorer and how to host it on your own. So the web version is different from a local host version, obviously. Uh, the tool itself is written in Node.js. It uses AWS, uh, CloudFront, load balancers, e EC2 instances, DynamoDB for storage and logs. This is only the web version. If you want to run it locally, you don't need any of this. It has scripts to build and install non-proprietary compilers hosted in the infra repository. Uh, currently, you need Node.js version 16 uh, later on. I think the dependency will change to 18, but you need to have Node.js 16. So maybe building inside a virtual environment or Docker is recommended. So even they use Docker, the public instance uses Docker. And one interesting thing is uh, MSVC, uh, the Microsoft Visual Studio uh, compiler, it runs via uh, remote connection. So basically, MSVC is a licensed product. So uh, if you want to like run it locally before they were optioning, uh, offering an option via Wine emulation, so that is still supported. But if you really want to run on a bona fide Windows machine, they have arranged that uh, msvc.godvolt.org or choosing msvc will run your code on a remote Windows machine in return. So why should you host Godvolt locally? I mean, uh, uh, like and for a lot of casual developers yes you don't need to host it locally <clears throat> but if you are exploring compilers or if you are developing a compiler and especially a proprietary compiler it makes a lot of sense to host it locally so one is supporting an in-development compiler so you can link into compiler under development and test features as they are being built so if you like build a llvm once and you just rebuild it, the URL where the binary is being built will not change. So if you just point it to that, as you make live edits to that, you can see your compiler changing and you can test out features. And of course, if you host it locally, then you don't have to worry about copyright and your code getting stolen or your compiler's internals being leaked to the internet. So uh, Godbolt uses AWS uh, servers. It uses NSJL and FireJail. To not allow arbitrary and uh, like uh, execution because obviously you are exposing uh, your computer to an online compiler and anyone can submit any code to that. So it does use NSJL and FireJail, but uh, they don't encrypt the code. And uh, uh, Godbolt has uh, does store your code. So if you ever have any sensitive code, like your company has some code that is client only, even if it is just a test case then you should not use the web version of Godbolt for understandable reasons because you are exposing your code to a risk. So to generate permanent links, they use we have to consent to Godbolt's privacy policy, which is basically that they store our code. Although they claim that they don't see it, but yeah, from a legal point of view, it's a headache. Uh, and uh, the public instance of Godbolt, the website, it refuses to compile programs that take a very long time because of compute limitation. But uh, if you host it locally, then there are no limitations. You can compile arbitrarily large programs, at least within a reasonable limit. You can set your own defaults. So if you have like, if you're not satisfied with Godbolt's default settings, uh, you can configure it on your own local instance. And finally, the creator of Godbolt himself recommends it. He says that the backend is not very secure. And if you have very serious work and you have a lot of staging compilers or proprietary compilers to deal with, you should host it yourself. So you can locally host it. You can either run it on a machine or on a GNU screen session or in a Docker container. If you want an easy to use a Docker container, you can see Michelle Aducci's uh, GitHub repo. It has a Docker compiler explorer Docker image. Uh, I highly recommend using the Docker image. By default, it will run on port uh, 10 to 40 by, of your machine. So just like how localhost 8080 is there, you just need your IP address followed by 10 to 40. There's a lot of documentation on how you can add compilers. 
they have an entire uh, GitHub page on adding compilers. In fact, so you have their uh, GitHub repository here, and it has uh, an FAQ. It has uh, uh, running a local instance, and it has an infra project uh, page. So you can see here there's an adding a compiler page, and over here they've given you exact steps to how to add each and every compiler. So uh, you can. Uh, uh, like uh, right now, locally hosted versions can support adding almost any free or proprietary compiler. So C, C++, Fortran. I have personally tried GCC, Clang, LLVM, MSVC, ICX, IFX, NVIDIA Fortran, Classic Clang, EOCC Clang, NAG Fortran. Uh, you have to agree to the license of each compiler that you install. So yeah, that is there, but uh, most of them are there. So you have to just clone the repository for the compiler explorer repository and the infra repository. You have to set your Node.js version to 16. You can choose any x6, but they prefer NTS versions. Then you have to do like this is steps for Linux. I don't know how it will work for Windows. And honestly, I don't care. I don't use Windows that much, but uh, you have to do an NPM install and then you have to just make. So as soon as you hit make, your local instance will start running. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize that your examples like sharing the links and URLs, which is there in the public version, they will also work for your self-hosted version. Instead of godbolt.org, you just have your IP address.org slash whatever. So you can add a compiler into Godbolt Explorer. Uh, you can just go into CE and over there you have to set the path. So you have a land.defaults.properties file. So for C++, you have C++.defaults.properties file. For uh, Rust, you have Rust.defaults.properties file. For Fortran, you have Fortran.default.properties file. You can even define your own uh, uh, properties file if your language is uh, something new, although you'll have to tweak it a little more. So in the top in the category, you give your category name for that category. So say you have clan 10, clan 11, clan 12. That's your group. And then you can give a set of default uh, instructions if you want. So I have MLVM and x86 ASM syntax is equal to Intel uh, because I don't want to deal with at and syntax. And then you just give a path to the compiler on your local machine. So here it's relative paths, but uh, that's because I've hidden it for uh, my machine. But you can, you should probably use absolute paths. Or if you're using a Docker container, maybe even relative paths is okay. And yeah, whatever you name the compiler. So you don't have to stick to the trade name. You can name it whatever you like. So for adding proprietary compilers, uh, you have a bit more settings because open source compilers are already like pre-configured to an extent. But for uh, you have to download and execute the install the compiler executable. Then you have to def define a, a compiler group, and then you have to define the right configuration keys. So it's stuff like name, which is the human readable name of the compiler, the path to the executable, and alias. Uh, what compiler options you want? Whether you want Intel ASM or not? Whether you need uh, uh, multiple architecture support? This is yes by default whether you want to support compiling to binary or not. So like, let's say you want your own uh, proprietary compiler to be hosted on uh, godbolt.org, but you want to disable uh, like say LLVM output or binary output, you can do that. You can uh, disable binary, you can disable execution, you can set version flags, you can set the compiler type and the execution wrapper. So if you want to add a remote compiler, like let's say you have a Windows compiler and a C++ compiler, and you want to be able to access them through one Godbolt instance. So this is the real only one of the use cases I found, but let's say that you have something that is tied to hardware, like you need to test the performance of your compiler on some specific hardware that you have. So you can set it up normally, you have to do an NPM install, uh, on your Windows compiler executable path, you have to just test if Godbolt is working on port 10 to 40. On your Linux machine, you have to just give a path, uh, Windows my host, uh, my Windows host at 10 to 40. So basically, it's like setting a path, but you will be providing a URL, which includes your uh, IP address, your internal IP address. So I know this will go over the internet. It will be within your network only. So uh, if you want to know more about Godbolt, 
there's a top 10 bolt at cpp on 2019 it's a very good talk there's a lot of documentation on uh, github the infrastructure uh, scripts are all in the infra repo there's an acm article uh, there's a compiler explorer repository and there's their twitter page that i mentioned earlier so that largely brings the talk to a close uh, there are several important links if you want to stay in touch with the llvm project itself we have the LLVM weekly newsletter by Alex Bradbury. You have the LLVM Discord server, uh, which where you can ask good questions. You have the discourse page, which is a more formal forum for uh, people to ask questions and to see discussions around how the compiler is evolving. You have the LLVM YouTube page where all of the talks from uh, the previous LLVM conferences are hosted, including uh, compiler, some talks on Compiler Explorer and other such tools. Uh, LLVM also has a new initiative known as Office Hours, where you can book a slot with, uh, uh, you know, an uh, expert from the LLVM field and have a chat with them. So this is also a facility. You also have uh, project specific meetings. So if you want to get involved in one of the new LLVM projects like LLVM Flying or MLIR, and you want to attend the open meetings and just uh, listen in and contribute, you can do that. And uh, finally, there's LLVM Social Bangalore's meetup page and our YouTube channel. So please do follow our YouTube channel. We post all our talks there. And uh, uh, Pradeep has been posting the talks of this series also. So if you want to see the, if you join this chat for the first time or this meeting for the first time and you want to see the previous ones, you can go to the YouTube channel. We'll be sharing the slides. Uh, if you want easy access, uh, Pradeep will be sharing the link to our WhatsApp community that we've set up for this meeting series and for future talks that uh, LLVM Bangalore organizes. So uh, just join that WhatsApp chat. He'll be putting it in the Teams. So that brings my talk to a close. And uh, the last 15 minutes are reserved for questions. So do you have any questions and comments? Uh, we'd love to take them. Uh, anything from anyone? I hope I'm still audible. Uh, I can drop off or something. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Sudesh. Uh, yeah, you're audible. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thanks. For the Thank time. Thank you. Thanks I, my a first lot. question got uh, answered. <laughs> Uh, in the previous <laughs> stories, I had the second question. Um, yeah, sure. So, how customizable is it? I can find out using the docs, <laughs> but I just wanted to ask here uh, lazily. So, uh, can I, I customize this, yeah. for example, the two diffs that are being shown? Uh, yeah. Probably the default will be the text diff. Yeah. Let's say I want a more advanced diff which ignores some things. Can I do such things there? Uh, if you can do it via compiler flags, then yes, I think anything that you can do via compiler flags is easy to make it visible. But uh, if it's something via, like, say, you're using the command line to filter out certain patterns or something, mm -hmm. so I think that is going to be a little more challenging. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That, that's it. I took it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so we have some questions, I think. Will you also share the examples link in the PPT? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, these uh, links are all clickable. So when I share the PDF with you all, you can just click the link and you will get access to the exact same example that uh, I have shown you, although they are very basic examples. Uh, so uh, Pradeep has shared the link to the WhatsApp chat. I think I'll be posting the talk there and later on it will be posted in the YouTube channel also. So uh, you can definitely follow that. So, yeah, I'll be sharing that. Let's see the other questions. New in this domain and wanted to know about the problems that haven't been solved by compiler technology. So 
Uh, we have discussed this in previous sessions, but uh, there are a lot of problems that haven't been solved by compiler technology. Uh, obviously, compilers are all never as fast as we, we want them to be. And then there's some basic stuff like uh, there's some code that has to be executed on CPUs. There's some code that has to be offloaded on GPUs. So, are there any automatic heuristics that you can sort of decide, you know, whether to execute something on a CPU or a GPU? There's a lot of open problems related to uh, how to best use optimization how to even apply machine learning techniques to optimization. And uh, indeed, there's a lot of uh, startups and organizations working around in cutting its space. Any basic set of exercises that uh, on these topics that you re recommend to uh, 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 learn better? So uh, basic set of exercises as in, I think the best way to get started is to just write small programs, uh, execute them through the tool, and uh, uh, like either through Compiler Explorer or through on your own. Even uh, building the compiler is a learning exercise, right? So you write really small prog problems, you uh, programs, you break them down, you add various compiler flags, you see the output, you add something else, you see how that changes. Once you feel like uh, confident, maybe read a textbook or two on compilers. Uh, that definitely helps learn some compiler theory. Uh, LLVM, GCC, Clang, all are open source projects. So uh, the source code is usable for everyone to see. If you want to contribute to them, you can definitely start by solving a few simple bugs and uh, break in that way. Uh, yeah, so this looks like it can be used as a compiler debugger too, like checking the CSG to see whether an optimization goes well or not. Yes, that is true. I think uh, the tool also supports GDB out of the box. I haven't really checked yet, but uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a bunch of debuggability, like uh, basically, like let's say you can add uh, hyphen G flags to enable debug support and you can uh, see whether some optimization kicked in or not. Like you can always execute your code at some optimization level and check whether a particular optimization kicked in or not. If the corresponding IR isn't there, then it probably did. So, uh, does Compiler Explorer put a wrapper on top of my code? Uh, so, no. Uh, the instrumented example I showed you was only instrumented because of uh, the uh, flags that I added. I added a profile of set test coverage for coverage. If you don't add any flags for instrumentation, uh, Compiler Explorer will show you the exact same assembly that uh, your uh, home computer will show you, minus some trivial differences, maybe like uh, the header or uh, something like that. But uh, yeah, Compiler Explorer pretty much shows you the same output. So like as Matt Godbold mentioned in a talk, like uh, let's say you want to execute a program using Compiler Explorer. Basically, Compiler Explorer runs the program twice. So if I click here, uh, execute the code, then it will basically uh, do it twice. First, it will uh, uh, execute it once with the right set of flags to show the assembly. And then it will execute it again to generate the executor group. So no, it doesn't add on anything on top of the code because that would reduce its utility. It shows you the exact uh, same output. So lately I got to know about ABI from that. At what stage of compilation we take input from the API? At yeah, this time, I'm not sure. I know that C++ has an ABI, but not to familiar with it. Well, what is the GCC RTL3 tool in Compiler Explorer? So, okay, so here let's let's try it out. So we have a GCC3 slash RTL. So like, okay, we have just a hello world program. So maybe we didn't select anything, but yeah, you can see the simple tree or the RTL3. Uh, you basically, uh, just like how LLVM has an IR and LLVM has passes, uh, GCC also has a concept of uh, running passes. So, like, uh, let's say if you want to see all of the output of your uh, C++ program or C program in GCC through 
all of its passes. So you can give a flag like GCC uh, space uh, hyphen F dump tree or and then maybe you can use a CFG generation tool like uh, uh, CFG to PNG or something to generate uh, human readable CFGs. So that will show you how your GCC compiler basically optimizes your code over a dozen or so passes. Uh, how much ASM should we know to get started with this? So, uh, okay, that's a good question, but I think that uh, the tool is useful for learning ASM and not the other way around. So, if uh, basically if you're not very comfortable with assembly yet, maybe you could get started with something like learning MIPS assembly, which is simpler than x86 assembly. Uh, you could start with really small programs and uh, see their assembly representation. You don't need complete programs also, just bits that are compilable. And you, as I mentioned, you can always see the correspondence. Like here, you can see which assembly inspections exactly correspond to the while loop. So assembly really isn't all that difficult because uh, it's only doing one thing in every line, right? Like here, your JNE is your... Uh, basically, uh, a, uh, a jump instruction. So, uh, increment is an increment instruction. Ret is a return instruction. So, it's it's really not that complicated. Uh, yeah, you might not be able to read it as easily as code, but as long as you can see different programs and how the assembly evolves between them, uh, you should be good. So, Uh, we see CFG of assembly. Similarly, is there a CFG to view for ASP? So, uh, I'm not sure about this. I think the ASP uh, stage is before you can generate a control flow graph. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not so sure. But uh, yeah. You can see a visualization of the ASP if you want. You can do XClang and uh, dump AST uh, if you want to see a visualization of the AST. I think those were the questions. Uh, any other, anyone else has any other questions? Or uh, I think we're on top of the R anyway, so we can wrap up. I, I was just curious. Uh, so yeah. is there any time difference? Uh, so when we are generating, uh, let's say LLVM, uh, output LLVM IR output uh, yeah. for you know, passes. So for large shaders, we take a lot of time uh, yeah. whenever we are doing it locally. But uh, with Godbolt, uh, do we take more time than uh, what we would take using the command line, or uh, is it similar for so, big input? Yeah, so basically, you can think of Godbolt as a web window into executing compilers on your system, or in this case, locally, right? So since this is hosted on the internet, there will the additional latency that you will incur will basically be the code going from you typing it into wherever Amazon server it is hosted and from Amazon server back to your browser. But if you host it locally, then uh, the only trip it's taking is from your web browser to your system. So I don't know, maybe there will be a very, very small time lag uh, like additional time needed to execute the program. But uh, other than that, there should be no specific uh, difference. OK, yeah. uh, thanks. Yeah, it's basically it's still just a compiler at the end of the day, right? The tool itself is not doing anything. The tool is just offloading everything to your compiler, which is running on your computer. So we have another question in the chat, how to get all the flags that we can use. So I think we have a meeting upcoming on compiler flags, but uh, generally uh, each release comes with a release document. Each compiler release, uh, it has a lot of details about uh, what flags are there, but you have your basic optimization flags, your flags for code size, and the rest, it depends on what you want to do. Right. If you want to use open entry, there are specific flags related to that. If you want to dump assembly, there are flags for that. And of course, it depends on your compiler. 
the most of the common flags that do the same thing, like basic things are common across various C, C++ compilers, but the flags needed to do some very specific things or to turn on some advanced optimizations, they might be different across different compilers. So it really depends on your compiler and your use case. Uh, any other questions? I think we are last two minutes. And uh, yeah. thank you for attending. Yeah, very useful talk for me. Thanks, Ashwin. Thank you. Thanks a lot.